Thank, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I present today um, just a little bit of the journey. Um, I've, I've really just got some quite simple ideas that we've learned, I guess, with our journey over the years, and we've put together in a in a way that's you know proving to be really relevant to the this new world. Everyone's talking about the metaverse and. Uh, you know, what does it actually mean? I mean, I, I love the stuff that David was talking about. It's so wonderful to hear people talking about shaders and, <laughs> and so forth. Um, so it's, it's been quite a, a journey that we've had. So what I'll do, if you'll excuse, I only use a lot of pictures because we're all about pictures and images and how we communicate with them. So I'm going to use them as a prop for the speaking as we go along. So let me just start that up. So uh, one of the, the, the words that is out there at the moment is digital twins. Um, we've sort of been doing this. We like to joke that we've made more mistakes in the world of digital twins than anyone else and that we've actually learned a little bit uh, as we've gone along. So I'll, I'll just quickly go through a little bit of history of what we've been doing. Um, we, uh, and, th and thank you for that introduction. We, we've um, been working on this since 1987 with CADS and uh, we built this company, Right Hemisphere, that was really focused around bringing data and visualising it from engineering systems and putting all the information together, and I'll show you some more detailed stuff of that. Um, the company was actually acquired by SAP, in fact, in 2011, uh, but that was after we founded a company called Nextspace. And so I've circled back to Nextspace and tried to apply some of the learning, you know, that we got in the first round uh, to what we're doing now, and and uh, that's, that's where we're, we're going with that. So that was me. I went from uh, SAP to to next space again. Um, we, we started uh, doing, you know, CAD CA, we sold CAD systems. So we learned a lot about everything from uh, civil engineering to chip design and so forth. Being in New Zealand to survive as a CAD company, we had to, to learn a lot of different trades just to be relevant. You know, we don't have a, a lot of money in any particular vertical, but I think that generalization uh, has been very helpful for us. We, we built the first 3D paint. We, I had Lord of the Rings um, talked about before. We built the 3D paint that painted orcs, for example, and games. I think about half the games in the 1990s were actually painted with our technology. Um, and then we, we got into you know, bringing a bit more engineering back to engineering roots, film and game and entertainment. So we've, we've spent a lot of time in that area as well. In 2003, we built the first a billion polygon render in a kind of a technical race with Boeing themselves, and they've become really good friends. You know, we're still working with the teams there that are involved in that. Uh, we worked, we built, some of you may have heard of 3D PDF technology. We, we developed that. Uh, that was developed again with, with Boeing, and, and that was about bringing together all the data around um, the engineering models, because it was much more, the problem was that they wanted to to start communicating using 3D, but the practicality of that is that you need to have all of your dimensions, tolerances, annotations, sections, bond structures, differentiation, and so forth. We learned a lot on that, and so to be able to translate not just 3D geometry, but all of the semantic information that surrounds a 3D model is really critical. And you have to do that with accuracies in the 99.99 sort of ranges to meet FAA requirements. So we, we had a lot of experience sort of pulling apart file formats, and that was that was an important part of uh, where we've been. We did AR and VR back in 2005, the Joint Strike Fighter program. This is what we were doing uh, with manufacturing. We built manufacturing systems that, um, and we found this is uh, this highly visual approach to um, work, you know, workshop floor training. Um, the idea, this was actually from Eclipse. In fact, in this case, we did this for Boeing in a number of places, was that, um, you know, where there are language barriers or, or other skills training issues, you know, being able to enable our workforces quickly and efficiently was really important. Um, and again, you know, again, it comes back to safety issues. So the, these were the type of things that we'd do, and these were all linked back at a data level. Um, so and we, we did some exciting stuff with Harvard and HMX, and we, we did the first 3D you know, publication with them. So uh, after all of that learning, we sort of had a, well, you know, what, what next? What, what do we actually learn? And um, we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could actually help bring together all the data that we've found from various systems? You know, we'd pulled apart data from engineering CAD systems, from, you know, civil engineering systems. We, we really knew our, round, our way around file formats and so forth. And uh, the, the idea was to build 
something we, we kept seeing presentations made. People would build a presentation, whether it was around uh, you know, an engineering proposal, an architectural proposal, a product proposal, whatever it is, and they would spend an awful lot of time uh, creating outputs with ETL process, you know, that extract, translate, and load data from various systems, and these would arrive, and then they would be amalgamated together using um, games type applications or rendering applications, and then the raw data would change. Um, and then there'd be another scramble to get it up to date. And so you ended up with presentations that um, you know, would rework, rework, rework. And the amount of um, time money spent on it you know, was obviously important because people love communicating visually. It's a very powerful way to, to uh, present you know, complex data, as we've already seen. Uh, so data lakes, you know, uh, you know, let's bring our data together, can we leverage those? The problem is um, the um, semantics, you know, around a data lake, you know, to actually just throw all the data, there's a feeling, well, let's just throw all the data and we'll let AI sort out all of our data ontologies and relationships and taxonomies, and it's not currently working according to the people using it. Now, there may be some wonderful developments we may hear about, you know, today, but uh, essentially one of the big problems was actually creating you know, a more structured approach to reading engineering data and assigning it, you know, to the visualisation side of things. So we've just taken some simple ideas, which is about, um, you know, the memory, the method of loci, which, uh, or memory palace, just a tool, you know, we, we, it's a tool that uses our natural inclination to understand complexity through, you know, visualisation. We walk, we, we model a room, um, and, and, you know, in our mind, and then we walk through it and we put things there, and it's, it's a visual aid. You know, we, we will naturally want to navigate complexity in a spatial way, so that's, you know, where the method of loci comes from. And the idea of ontology, this, this ability to take, you know, the financial representation of the things you care about and the manufacturing representation of the things that you care about and the engineering and the procurement. And this is one of the things that we learnt uh, you know, in complex manufacturing environments, everyone loves the 3D model. We built this fantastic 3D model for, for Boeing, um, and they thought, this is great. And the manufacturing department said, look, can we use that? That'd be fantastic. She said, yeah, of course, we can re reconfigure this. And they got it. And what they found, they said, the first thing they said was, this is great, but we only need 20% of the data attribution of engineering. And by the way, we organize everything differently. We structure the, the components differently from the way engineers, but we still want it. And so you, you try and do that uh, with file formats and, and you, you, it all falls to pieces. So we, we had to come up with something that can relate the taxonomies or the structures that engineering, finance, manufacturing, procurement, all these have different places, but they're all talking about the same thing. So how do we join that together? So we apply the concepts of uh, ontology and we do it, we add a visual layer to it, we say, Everything that we encounter uh, not only has a conceptual uh, representation as a, you know, some kind of unique entity within the universe, but it also has a, a, a number of visual proxies. And I'll use the example here in the plant and process world. Uh, we have multiple different visualizations of it for different purposes. Um, so if we have a, a 3D model of, you know, um, a plant, we might have a valve in there. That valve will have uh, a little 2D representation of what's called the PNID diagram or the process and instrumentation. And that's used to see schematically how it connects. So you can very quickly see if I turn that off, what it affects, what it doesn't affect. If I want to see where it is in the plant, I need the 3D model. If I want to actually see the condition of it, I need you know, point cloud scans or I want, I want to build my model. But ultimately, I might have photographs, 2D images, ISO images, point clouds, photos, 3D models, all representing the same thing. And we want to make sure that we keep track of that. We also want to keep track of the fact that it has a relationship with a larger network of pipes, a larger network of, of information. So um, pulling all that together and managing the data as it comes in from these different systems, being able to deconstruct that data, manage it at a unique ID level, and then understand as data changes and moves how we can actually create dynamic visual representations of real world environments. The idea um, of this is that we've got to also uh, unify standards. We've got a problem with standards out there. Everyone is um, struggling to move forward with data. Um, and it's often on the belief that until standards are all agreed on, 
that you can't actually achieve unification of data. And I think that this is no longer true. I think you know, we, 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 can, we have the tools now to actually merge data. We can dynamically merge standards from the past to an agreed standard. And by dynamically keeping this mapping, which I'll show a real story, this is actually a screenshot from our user interface. So in here, we've, in New Zealand, we've got about 60 councils, and uh, which is crazy, storing our three waters network. And they've all uh, decided, each one of them almost to, to a council has decided they know the best way to store the information about a round thing that goes from point A to point B in the ground, and they've all got their own data schemas. So when we are looking, we've got a multi-billion dollar infrastructure renewal problem, and to be able to, start to do a search which says, look, we've found a, a pattern of failure with concrete pipes, you know, greater than a certain diameter in the soil type, how do we actually run a search and find all the pipes in New Zealand when we've got 60 different data systems, 60 different data schemas? And so what we do is we apply our tools, and you can actually see here, we've got about 40 of those councils lined up, and we draw the, these mappings from the um, source systems, so you don't have to change what you know, the original guys are doing. You come up with a perfect agreed schema, which we know will change next Tuesday, but for the moment, we can draw all of the lines, and we can put little functions and said, we'll convert that unit to that unit, we'll convert that projection system to that, we'll look up an address, we'll link it all together, and we store that. And when it changes next Tuesday, we don't have to change one line. And each time now, it can go through all of these 40, 50 councils and update the data to a single schema without requiring a single change to the actual source systems that are creating this data in the first place. So you can see the data in both ways, and it's dynamically mapped. And this applies to ETL processes, IoT, uh, pretty much any data source. We break it down and, you know, with an ontology concept, what is the thing that you care about? What are the attributes of those things that you care about? What are the relationships between that thing and other things that exist? And they can be multi-dimensional, multi you know, topology, connected to, connected from, parent, child. And so about to store that in a singular model and then add the dimension, what do these things look like? And, and the, the issue of you know, what do they look like means that we can start representing things. We can represent sp geospatially, you know, semi-geospatially, like with these relationship diagrams. This is actually kiwi fruit distribution from New Zealand to Japan. But it also addressed one of the things we've seen at the moment where people start, you know, they, everybody's, we're very cautious with the word digital twins. It can mean many things to different people. I'll, I'll use it here in a broader sense and perhaps define it a little bit as if we have time. But a lot of people try and start their digital twin journey by saying, let's go and find a visualization system and throw a whole lot of data at it. And we're saying, no, start with the data. And if you do it right, you can actually choose any visualization tool that you want. Because it's guaranteed there'll be better visualization tools you know, next month, next year. There'll be different file formats. But if you can gather the data together, in a construct using ontology, which has stood the test of time for a couple of thousand years, then you can actually move with the future and create future-proof digital twins. So this is our sort of picture of, of how this should fit together, which is you bring things in, you create a state engine, which is very good at representing the way things were, the way things are, and the way things might be. And then you should be able to apply it, visualize that. And we, we've built some tools that will visualize that across multiple different games, engines, and rendering systems. But you're free to pick your own. But simulation analytics, um, the same ontology, the same approach to um, you know, relating you know, a range of different geometric representations to things, their attribution, um, their structures and relationships, is equally um, good at feeding simulation and analytics in a really um, well-considered manner, as well as the visualization. Uh, the visualization is looking for, you know, information that we talked about, David, you know, the, you know, what is your normal maps, your, you know, um, BRDF um, definitions and so forth, you know, your weights, you're doing physical simulations. But, you know, when you've got things like, well, supply chain data, well, that's going to come from a dynamic source probably sitting in your ERP system. So if I want to do an anal anal you know, analytic on supply chain, I might have to gather together data on the geometry, size, weight, you know, how many in stock, 
And so the goal here is not to be a repository of truth, but simply to create a system that is a singular access point to many sources of truth. I think this singular data lake approach, uh, I don't, I, I'm not sure that it's actually relevant. I think now it's much more about creating mappings to existing systems. So um, we, we think this is really an you know, important point. If we're going to have the metaverse, whether it's consumer or industrial, getting a fundamental control and agreement on the nature of things, you know, their attributes we care about, their relationships, is going to be really important. And it's also a model uh, to scale this. And you know, I show here, you know, it's about world scale. We can go into a GIS scale of things. We can go down to a city block scale of things. We can go right down to a building scale of things. We can go to a building detail uh, of things. You know, remember the big question came up in, in London you know, with the fire, the cladding. You know, what's the cladding on that building? Well, it should, of course, be there. And the, the problem was you had different data systems all disconnected. So you, no one could actually answer the question, for any given building in London, what's on the, you know, what's the cladding? So this is about integrating you know, BIM, GIS data and so forth. You can get down into the detail of you know, individual utilities, pipes. Um, you can see inside, you can touch objects and get their full information. You can get down to a light switch level and you can even go into the circuit. And that's, I think, the power of ontology is because you can actually scale and manage scale you know, through levels of detail management, all linked to the same data. Because when I touch on that building, it doesn't matter whether I'm looking at a, a low you know, point. That building can be a point on a map, a building footprint extruded, it can be a photo. Yep, <laughs> thank you. I'm uh, moving away from the, the mic here. So, it, you know, any of these visual representations are useful and we can use them to navigate, but ultimately the, the critical data behind them is going to be held in a much more complex structure. Um, and we can deal with product, you know, complexity, scale, you know, the multitude of different media and so forth. Just you know, within a plant, you know, we touch an object, we're going to have documents about this, we're going to have schematic diagrams, we're going to have analytics results, we're going to have IoT feeds, we're going to have many, many pieces of information about a thing of interest. And ultimately, the visual is only a way to navigate to data rather than um, the thing itself. And that's a big confusion we see with people building digital twins. They consider a visual, you know, visualization of a thing as being the thing. It's not. It's just a tool to navigate to it. So we talk about people taking a journey. You know, we, we're just here to help with a really simple thing. I think there's so much cleverness out there to be utilized, but we, we feel there needs to be a better framework um, for thinking about the way that we deal with our engineering data from so many different sources, how we map it together with our GIS information, with our financial information, with our supply chain information from the ERP system. There's so many different systems, legacy source, and this ontology is a framework of thinking as much as anything of how to join together data from legacy systems to then take full advantage of this you know, amazing world of um, AI and simulation, you know, predict, obviously, and optimize our world. So, just some ideas to, to leave you with. Um, you know, we think ontology helps manage all these different uh, taxonomies and join data across different data silos, which is a huge problem out there. Um, people love visualization, whether it's you know, direct or abstract. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of ways to use that. And if we can apply that thinking, that visual thinking back to ontologies, there's, there's, a, whole, um, there's a whole world of communication that can happen that isn't happening today efficiently. And time-based ontology, you know, the way to be able to represent the way things were, and that's, you know, changed relationships, new entities, entities of interest come into a, a, a universe that we care about, and they leave them. Relationships form and they dissipate. And, and so being able to actually add the temporal um, dimension to all the aspects of ontology is important. And um, lastly, you know, we haven't talked a lot about it, but I think, you know, trust is a really important issue with data, and I think there's a lot of opportunities to introduce blockchain into these, you know, highly visual uh, data presentations, and, and um, those, as those presentations become long-term, you know, digital representations of what's going on in the real world. It's not something you throw away, so it's something you've got to trust for the future. So I think blockchain is um, is an important aspect of, you know, uh, of you know, creating. A, uh, an environment where we know that you know, when we see this, we trust that it's legally um, uh, it's legally relevant. You know, to to um, to have visualization be because it's got to reach a, a, a level of legal credibility. I think that's an important point for it. So, 
I'm trying to make this a bit quicker for you because I know everyone wants to get to the next morning tea, but I'd um, love to take any questions.